On a night in late September of 1994, 18-year-old Aaron Itura sat at the very front of a packed meeting room in a community center in Eugene, Oregon, staring out at the crowd of mostly teenagers. The fold-out metal chair Aaron was sitting on was too small for his 6-foot, 5-inch, 230-pound frame, so he shifted back and forth to try to get comfortable. Some of the kids sitting out in the audience looked excited to be there, and others looked nervous. But the only people in the crowd that really stood out to Aaron were the young men sitting in a cluster right off to the side of the room. They leaned forward in their chairs, showed off their blue bandanas wrapped around their wrists, and glared at Aaron like they wanted to challenge him to a fight. Over the last year, Aaron had become an important member of an anti-gang task force in Eugene that was led by a woman named Mary Thompson, who was sitting right next to him. And Aaron spent a lot of his free time going with Mary to community centers and high schools in the area to talk about the dangers of gang life, just like he was going to do tonight. The crowds that Aaron and Mary spoke to at these events usually included kids and teenagers who had thought about joining a gang but wanted something better out of life. They also included former gang members who were trying to turn their lives around and current gang members who had been forced to attend by the state as part of their punishment for a crime they'd committed. But tonight, Aaron knew the cluster of young men glaring at him from the audience didn't fit into any of those groups. These were current gang members who were here by choice. They just wanted to intimidate Mary, Aaron, and the others who had come to speak out against gang life. And he knew, because of their blue bandanas, that they were members of Eugene's most powerful gang, the 74 Hoover Crips. And as far as they were concerned, Aaron was clearly their enemy. In school, Aaron saw members of the 74 Hoover Crips bully kids who they believed were weak and would fight anyone they didn't like. And he saw how the gang spread violence and fear throughout Eugene. At the convenience store where Aaron worked, he'd witnessed knife fights and robberies carried out by gang members, and he knew the gang was tied to much bigger crimes in the city like carjackings, assaults, and drug trafficking. Eugene was a relatively small college town known for its natural beauty with the Cascade Mountains in the east and the Willamette River winding through the city. But the 74 Hoover Crips had created something ugly amidst those beautiful surroundings. And Aaron wanted to help stop the spread of gang-related crime and violence before it completely overran his beloved hometown. The crowd quieted down as Mary Thompson stood up, stepped forward, and introduced herself. Aaron had seen Mary speak dozens of times, but he was still blown away by how well she commanded a room. That night, she talked about the problems gangs posed in the city and how it was up to people like her and everyone in the audience to turn away from gangs and become a positive force in their community. And most of the audience hung on her every word. But Mary said this meeting was not about her. She believed that teenagers wanted to hear from other teenagers way more than they wanted to hear from a woman who was almost 40 like her. So she thanked everyone for coming and then introduced Aaron. Aaron stood up from his chair, he smiled at Mary, and then took a few steps towards the audience. Even the toughest members of the 74 Hoover Crips in the crowd were taken aback by Aaron's huge size. But Aaron almost always had a smile on his face, and his voice was warm and soft, which was why he was known around school as the, quote, gentle giant. Aaron used his time in front of the group that night to talk about the future. He knew a lot of people in the crowd had made mistakes in the past, but that didn't mean they still couldn't achieve great things. He talked about how gangs could destroy young people's lives and how it was so important to find something positive to be passionate about. Aaron explained that his own passion was art. He said he loved to draw and he worked hard to keep getting better at it. And he said his passion for drawing had led him to apply to art school in New York City. And now when he graduated from high school, he was going to pursue something he loved and have an adventure on the other side of the country. At the end of Aaron's talk, members of the audience applauded, and Mary beamed as she looked out at the crowd. But as Aaron took his seat, he noticed the cluster of young men with their blue bandanas on their wrists were not clapping. They were still just glaring at him. And when Mary stood up and wrapped up the meeting and said goodnight and told everyone to head out, those young men made sure to wait back and then stare back angrily at Aaron as they were the last to leave the room. 
Aaron tried not to let their stares bother him, but he couldn't help but feel a little rattled. Clearly, their intimidation technique had worked. But after the audience had left, Mary came over to him and gave him a big hug and said he did a great job, and suddenly Aaron felt a lot better. In the time that he had known Mary, he'd come to see her almost like a second mother. Aaron had a great relationship with his own mother, but he felt like Mary pushed him to be the best version of himself. And he was amazed that someone who had experienced as much heartache as Mary had could still be so positive and give so much of her time to helping others. Mary had become an anti-gang activist because she had personally seen what gangs in Eugene could do to young people and how they could tear families apart. Years earlier, Mary's son, Bo Flynn, had actually been one of the founders of Eugene's infamous 74 Hoover Crips when he was just 13 years old. And under Bo's leadership, the gang had grown, had acquired a sizable stash of guns, and had progressed from small-time robberies to more violent crimes with bigger payoffs. Mary had always been a very protective mother and would do anything for Bo, but she knew she was losing her son to this gang. And so, when Bo's gang lifestyle began catching up to him, and he started going in and out of juvenile detention centers, Mary decided to form an anti-gang group to try to prevent other parents from having to experience what she was currently experiencing with her son. Over the past couple of years, Mary's anti-gang group had grown, and she'd quickly become one of the most well-known anti-gang activists in the Pacific Northwest. Through meetings, seminars, and TV appearances, Mary's message reached thousands of people in the region. And for a time, Mary's anti-gang messaging was not just helping the community, it also appeared to be having an impact at home on her son. For the past year, Mary's son, Bo, who was now 16, had been home from his latest stint in a juvenile detention center, and at first when he got home, it seemed like he was ready to just walk away from gang life, that he understood it was not good for him. And Mary thought that it was not just her own influence that had caused this change in her son, but also it was Aaron's voice that her son had listened to and was now responding to. Aaron had liked Mary's son, Bo, from the moment he met him, and Aaron, who was the oldest of five children, treated Bo like another younger sibling who needed to be looked after and protected. The two young men spent lots of time together at Mary's house after school, they hung out on the weekends, and Aaron always did his best to keep Bo out of trouble. And as the boys spent more time together, Mary hoped that Bo would start to think about his future just like Aaron did. But Bo was not Aaron, and eventually, Bo was just not able to resist the allure of getting back into his gang life. And in mid-September, just weeks before Mary and Aaron's anti-gang meeting with the intimidating young men with bandanas staring at Aaron, Bo had gotten into a knife fight with a rival gang member, and he'd ended up back in a juvenile detention center. Mary was obviously heartbroken, and she now worried that Bo might never get to come home again. In the weeks following the knife attack by Bo and the anti-gang meeting that Aaron and Mary had run, Aaron continued to work with Mary to organize other events for the anti-gang group, but he also thought it was important to focus on the things he personally really loved in his life, like his artwork, his family, and his girlfriend. Aaron had been dating 22-year-old Carrie Barkley for a little over four months, and both of them were convinced the other was the love of their life. Their relationship had gotten serious very quickly, and so Carrie regularly spent the night at Aaron's house. In fact, she was there so often that Aaron's mother had begun to view Carrie less as Aaron's girlfriend and more as her daughter-in-law. At 10 p.m. on Sunday, October 2nd, so a few weeks after Bo's knife attack and Aaron and Mary's anti-gang meeting, Aaron and Carrie were relaxing on the couch inside of Aaron's home, watching TV and talking. Aaron sat with his arm wrapped around Carrie's shoulders, and Carrie, who was already dressed for bed in a white t-shirt and pajama pants, was curled up tightly right next to him. And as they sat there enjoying the night, the landline phone in Aaron's house suddenly started ringing. And immediately, Aaron leapt up off the couch and rushed to go answer it. But before he could, he heard the oldest of his sisters pick up the phone in her bedroom. So Aaron turned around and sat back down on the couch next to Carrie and put his arm back around her and kept watching TV. But almost as soon as he'd sat down, his sister, who had just answered the phone, walked into the living room. 
She said the person on the phone had asked for Aaron, but when she told the caller she'd go get him, the caller had hung up. Aaron told his sister not to worry about it, but when she left the room, a look of concern came across Aaron's face. He didn't know why someone would call him so late on a Sunday night just to hang up. But when Carrie, who could now see the look of concern on Aaron's face, asked Aaron what was wrong, he said, oh, everything's fine. Whoever called must have just realized they didn't actually need to talk to me, and so that's why they hung up. Carrie shrugged, and then the two of them settled back down on the couch and watched TV and talked for a few more hours. Then finally, at around midnight, Carrie said she was tired, so they decided to go to bed. After turning off the TV, Aaron and Carrie got up and walked across the first floor of the house to the door that led into the garage. Aaron had built a makeshift bedroom inside of the garage. It was like a little cubicle in the corner with a sheetrock wall and a wooden door for privacy. And so Aaron and Carrie walked into the garage and made their way over to Aaron's bedroom door. They opened it up and stepped inside. The room was very small, with two mattresses piled up on the floor, and on the walls were posters of some of Aaron's favorite bands and movies, along with some of his own drawings and a few beer ads featuring scantily clad women. There were also empty pizza boxes and fast food bags on the floor, because Aaron and Carrie often ate in this room by themselves, and neither of them really liked to clean up. Carrie climbed onto the mattresses, slid over to her side of the bed furthest from the door, and got under the covers. Then, Aaron took off his shirt and jeans, got into bed next to her, gave her a kiss, and then soon after that, they both drifted off to sleep. About an hour later, at around 1.30 a.m., Aaron's mother, who was asleep in her first floor bedroom, woke up suddenly to the sound of screaming. As she sat up in bed, she thought the sounds were coming from the TV in the living room, that maybe Aaron and Carrie had left it on. But when she stepped out into the hallway, she could tell right away the screaming was not coming from the TV. It was coming from a real person, likely inside of the garage. Aaron's mom sprinted down the hallway through the living room to the door that led into the garage. And then once she was in the garage, she could tell the screaming was coming from Carrie, who was still inside of Aaron's actual little bedroom. So Aaron's mother rushed over to the door, she flung it open, and when she saw what was inside, she began screaming too. And then eventually she turned around and ran back into the house and dialed 911. A couple hours later, at almost 4 a.m., Detective Jim Michaud of the Violent Crime Squad of the Eugene Department of Public Safety drove his 1993 Ford Taurus down a quiet, tree-lined street towards Aaron's house. When Detective Michaud pulled up to the modest, two-story, split-level house with a two-car garage in front, he saw red and blue flashing lights from the police cruisers parked outside and yellow crime scene tape strung across the front of the house. Michaud thought a scene like this seemed so out of place in such a quiet and safe neighborhood. After parking, Michaud stepped out of his car and breathed in the crisp morning fall air. He was a veteran in law enforcement and an experienced lead detective, but there was something about receiving calls in the dead of night that still put him on edge. But at least he knew what he was about to walk into. He'd been informed that an 18-year-old male named Aaron Itora had been found shot in his bedroom and that he had been rushed to the hospital. Michaud had also been told that there was no sign of forced entry and that the victim's girlfriend had been found in bed with him, but completely unharmed. And Michaud knew that in a situation like this, the girlfriend was usually the most obvious suspect. So Michaud walked up to the house where he was greeted by the officers who were already on the scene. Those officers led him inside the house where he saw Carrie sitting on the living room couch with Aaron's mother and his oldest sister. All three women were still in the clothes they'd been sleeping in and they were crying and holding each other. But before Michaud could talk to them, he needed to see the crime scene. So he walked past the women and followed the officers out to the garage and into Aaron's makeshift bedroom. And when he stepped into that bedroom, he saw a pool of blood on one of the pillows, as well as blood spatter on the walls. After Michaud had studied the room for a few moments, he turned and headed back into the main house. And when he did, crime scene techs filtered back into the garage bedroom to take more photos and take more blood samples. 
Once Michaud was back in the living room and began approaching the three crying women on the couch, one of them, Aaron's mom, lifted her head up, and seeing Michaud walking toward her, she started begging him if she could be allowed to leave and go to the hospital to be with her son. It had been hours since the ambulance had taken him, and she couldn't stand the thought of Aaron lying in a hospital bed alone with nobody who loved him nearby. In a gentle voice, Michaud said he would make sure she got to the hospital as soon as possible, but he needed to do a couple of things before he could let her go. He told Aaron's mom that he was the lead detective on this case and that he had a few questions for all of them. He also said that he would need to run gunpowder residue tests on her, her daughter, and Carrie. A residue test indicates whether or not someone has recently fired a gun. Michaud assured Aaron's mother that this test was standard protocol for shootings, and she said that she understood. As an officer swabbed the women's hands as part of that gunpowder residue test, Michaud took a seat in front of the couch. Then, in a calm, steady voice, he asked them if they had seen or heard anything unusual in the house the previous night. Carrie sat forward and looked around to see if anybody else was going to speak, and then she cleared her throat and began talking. And as she did, Michaud watched her closely, because as of right now, she was his primary suspect. As Carrie spoke with a shaky voice, she made it clear that she had been asleep in bed with Aaron when she heard this loud noise, and she said when she woke up because of this noise, she saw two men with blue bandanas over their faces rushing out of their little bedroom, and then she turned and saw Aaron was bleeding on the bed next to her. Michaud had worked enough violent crime investigations in the area to know that men in blue bandanas almost always meant the same thing the 74 Hoover Crips. So Michaud asked the women if Aaron had any connections to that gang. And at this, Aaron's mother told him that Aaron was heavily involved in Mary Thompson's anti-gang task force. The idea of gang members carrying out a hit on an anti-gang activist made a lot of sense to Michaud, but there were still a few things about the crime scene that stood out to him. There was no sign of forced entry into the house, and Carrie was left completely unharmed. And in all the gang-style hits that Michaud knew about, the shooters almost always made sure no witnesses were left behind, meaning they killed everyone. Michaud thanked the three women for their information and told Aaron's mother and sister that someone from victim services would arrive soon to escort them and the rest of their family to the hospital. Then Michaud turned to Carrie and said that she would actually need to come with him to the station. He explained that because she was literally in the room with Aaron when he was shot, she likely had more information that could really help the police. In reality, Michaud figured that either Carrie was lying about seeing those two men in bandanas, or she was telling the truth and he had yet another case of gang violence on his hands. Either way, he needed to question Carrie further. When Michaud and Carrie arrived at the police station, Michaud led her into a small bright room and then he sat down opposite her across a black wooden table. Carrie pulled a blanket she'd taken from Aaron's house tight across her shoulders, but Michaud could still see spots of blood all over her white t-shirt. And Michaud could also see that she was trembling under the blanket. Michaud began to ask Carrie about her and Aaron's relationship, if there were any problems between them, if they had fought recently. And Carrie would say no, they got along great, they were in love, they didn't fight, nothing. But when Michaud just continued to ask more and more questions about their relationship, Carrie picked up on the idea that she was being looked at as a suspect, and she finally just said, shouldn't you be out looking for the two men in bandanas that I saw? Why are we still talking about our relationship? Michaud could sense Carrie's frustration and figured at this point he likely was not going to get very much more information out of her. And so Michaud shifted the conversation to something different and really specific. He said, okay, thank you so much for your help, but before you go, do you remember if you noticed anything missing from the bedroom? Did these two men wearing bandanas steal anything? At first, Carrie said she couldn't think of anything, but then she remembered and she said, actually, yes, a pack of cigarettes was missing from her purse. Michaud thought this was an odd thing for someone to steal during a shooting, but he didn't bring that up. Instead, he just thanked Carrie for her time and said someone would be there soon to take her home. Then he got up from the table, headed out of the room, and walked outside to his car. 
He held up his hand to shield his eyes from the morning sun. He was tired, but he knew he still had a long way to go before he could rest. A few hours later, at around 10.30 a.m., Aaron's mother and Aaron's siblings were by Aaron's bedside at the hospital. As the machines that were keeping Aaron alive buzzed and beeped, Aaron's mother wiped the tears from her eyes and leaned in close to her son's ear. She whispered to him that she loved him and that he was the strongest person she ever knew, then she kissed him on his forehead. Fifteen minutes later, Aaron's brain activity ceased and he passed away. As doctors and nurses began coming into the room, Aaron's mother stepped back away from the bed and clung on to her other children who were crying in her arms. She had always said her family was like a wheel, and Aaron was the spoke that held it all together. Now he was gone, and she had no idea how she would keep living without him. A few hours after Aaron died, Detective Michaud parked his car outside of a house located only a few miles away from Aaron's house. Michaud had just learned that Aaron's mother, sister, and Carrie had all tested negative for gunpowder residue, which meant none of them had recently fired a gun and therefore very likely were not involved in Aaron's murder. And so, after receiving these results, Michaud believed that Carrie must have been telling the truth about the two men in bandanas she'd seen in Aaron's bedroom. And so, Michaud thought that a gang-style hit now seemed like the strongest possibility for what happened. So now, he wanted to talk to the person who knew more about Aaron's anti-gang activities than anyone else, Mary Thompson, Aaron's mentor and leader of the anti-gang task force. Michaud got out of his car and walked up to Mary's front door and knocked. A moment later, the door swung open, and Mary quickly ushered Michaud inside to the kitchen, where they both sat down. Mary said she could not believe what happened to Aaron. He had been such a positive influence on young people in Eugene, and he'd been such a vital part of her anti-gang work. And with her son Beau already locked away, she told Michaud losing Aaron felt like she'd lost another son. Michaud felt bad for Mary, but he knew he had to ask her some pretty difficult questions, so instead of trying to make small talk, he just looked her in the eyes and said, Mary, do you think Bo had anything to do with Aaron's death? Remember, her son Bo was a founding member of the 74 Hoover Crips, which Michaud believes were involved in Aaron's death. Mary immediately shook off the idea that Bo could have had anything to do with Aaron's murder, but after she said this, she stood up and began pacing around the room. Michaud noticed her somewhat anxious behavior and asked her, you know, how can you be so sure Bo was innocent? And Mary would say, well, for one, Bo and Aaron were really close, and two, Bo is in a juvenile detention center and has been for weeks and was when Aaron was killed, so he couldn't have done this. Michaud nodded like he agreed with her, but in truth, Michaud knew that it was entirely possible for crimes to be committed or at least masterminded from behind bars, especially when gangs were involved. And Michaud also knew mothers would often say anything to protect their sons, even if their son was clearly a gang member and she was clearly an anti-gang activist. So Michaud ultimately thanked Mary for her time and information and just asked her to please let police know if she thought of anything that might help with their investigation. And she said she would. Over the next few days, Michaud tried to question known members of the 74 Hoover Crips, but none of them were willing to talk to him because he was police. But on October 6th, so three days after Aaron's murder, Mary reached out to Michaud and gave him a huge tip. Mary's anti-gang work put her in contact with a lot of young people who were trying to get out of the gang life. But some of them still had connections to the 74 Hoover Crips, and she called police to tell them that some of those kids she worked with said they knew who had killed Aaron because the killers were bragging about it at school. Jim Elstad and Joe Brown were two teenage boys who had gone to school with Aaron and one of his sisters for years. At one time, they had all been friends, but recently, Jim and Joe had gotten heavily involved with the 74 Hoover Crips, and now they were being overheard bragging that they had shown their worth to the gang by killing one of the loudest anti-gang activists in Oregon, Aaron. Police tracked Jim and Joe down at their houses and brought them in for questioning. Michaud met with them in a small room similar to the one where he'd questioned Carrie. The fluorescent lights were bright and buzzing overhead. Michaud sat down across from them at a table and just stared at them for a minute. 
They were both average height or shorter, and neither of them looked like they weighed more than 150 pounds. As he stared at them, he was sure they never would have had the guts to try to take on the 6 foot 5 inch 230 pound Aaron if they didn't have a gun with them. Michaud eventually leaned back in his chair and then calmly said that he had heard they had been bragging at school about being the ones who'd killed the big guy. And Jim and Joe just grinned and said, yes, they were the ones who'd murdered Aaron. Michaud stared at them in shock. He'd just spent days dealing with other gang members who wouldn't say a word to him, and now these two boys weren't trying to hide their gang affiliations or their crime at all. What was going on? And so Michaud sat forward and asked them, okay, well, why'd you do it? And they said Aaron and his anti-gang activities were one of the main reasons police were paying so much attention to their gang, and they figured if they could take Aaron down, they could help bring down the entire anti-gang task force. Michaud could not believe how forthcoming they were being, so he just continued asking questions. He asked the boys to explain exactly how they killed Aaron, and again, without any hesitation, Jim and Joe told him. And the story they told matched up with the evidence police found in Aaron's bedroom, and it matched up with Carrie's story of what she saw on the night of the murder. Jim and Joe also told Michaud that after they shot Aaron and rushed out of his garage, they drove to the river and threw the gun in the water. And when they said this, Michaud remembered that earlier that day, a fisherman had turned in a gun he had retrieved in the water, and while police were still running tests on this gun to figure out if it was the murder weapon in Aaron's case, Michaud now understood that very likely it was. It was Jim and Joe's gun. After Jim and Joe told Michaud everything, Michaud arrested them for Aaron's murder. But while the rest of the police department began congratulating Michaud on getting the case solved so quickly, Michaud couldn't help but feel like something was off. This was too easy. Jim and Joe had said they killed Aaron to reduce attention on the 74 Hoover Crips, but Killing a well-known anti-gang activist who was beloved in the community seemed like a surefire way to do the opposite of that. So why in the world would the 74 Hoover Crips do something like this? Who would sign off on this? It all just seemed totally backwards. And it would turn out Michaud was right in thinking that this case was not quite solved yet. Because Aaron's mother would receive a very strange phone call not long after Joe and Jim were arrested, and when she told Michaud about this strange phone call, it would send Michaud down a path he never expected to go down. Based on that strange phone call Aaron's mother received, and evidence gathered and interviews conducted during the investigation, here is a reconstruction of what police believe happened to Aaron Itora in the very early hours of October 3rd, 1994. At 10 p.m. on October 2nd, a teenage girl sat in her bedroom. She stared at the swirling smoke and smelled the marijuana burning from the joint she held in her hand. With her other hand, she grabbed her phone and dialed a number. On the other end, she heard Aaron's sister answer. The girl asked the sister if Aaron was home. And as soon as Aaron's sister had said yes and that she'd go and get him, the caller hung up the phone. That was all the info she needed. The girl took another long, slow drag on the joint to calm her nerves. Then she picked up the phone again and dialed another number. It was the number to the leader of the 74 Hoover Crips. When the gang leader answered, the girl took a deep breath. Then she said Aaron was home. The gang leader told the girl she'd done a good job and then hung up. After that, the gang leader called a young man and told him that everything was in place and that tonight was the night. Hours later, at around 1 a.m. on October 3rd, two young men dressed in black with blue bandanas covering their faces walked down the street towards Aaron's house. The streetlights were bright, so they moved fast and tried to stay in the shadows. One of them clutched a 45 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver in his hand. When they reached Aaron's house, they stopped on the street out in front of it and just stared. All of the lights inside were off, and so the two young men hoped that this meant everyone inside was asleep. As they stared at the garage door that they knew led to Aaron's room, they both wondered if maybe they were going too far. 
but they knew if they didn't go through with this, they would be in trouble with the leader of their gang, and that was the last thing either of them wanted. So they eventually just nodded to each other and then walked up to the garage door. The garage door was not locked, so they crouched down and just slowly raised it up, trying to make as little noise as possible. And once they were inside the garage, they walked over to the corner where Aaron's makeshift bedroom was, they opened the door, and right away they could see Aaron and Carrie sleeping in the bed. The young man who had the gun in his hand stayed by the door, getting the courage up to fire the gun, while the other young man crept forward and grabbed Carrie's purse, which was lying on the ground next to the bed. And after looking through it, he found a pack of cigarettes, pulled them out, and held them up to his partner standing by the door with the gun, like he was holding up his prize. And then after tucking the cigarettes into his pocket, he made his way back to the door. And at this point, the young man with the gun finally had the courage up, and he stepped forward till he was right next to the bed, and he held the gun out and looked straight down at Aaron. Aaron was sleeping on his side, with his face looking away from the gunman at Carrie. Then the gunman took several short breaths, made sure he was aiming his revolver point blank at the back of Aaron's head, and then he fired. As the two young men turned and ran out of the bedroom, Carrie was already sitting up and screaming. So the two men just continued running out of the garage, out onto the street, down the road to their car. They hopped inside, they fired it on, peeled out, and sped off down the street. When the two young men got out of Aaron's neighborhood, they started laughing and shouting with excitement. Then they pulled down their blue bandanas, and both of them let out a huge sigh of relief. Jim and Joe were these two young men. They really had murdered Aaron just like they had confessed to. But they had left out a crucial detail to their confession, which was, who told them to kill Aaron? Not long after speeding away from Aaron's house, Jim and Joe arrived outside of a new location, another house. Once they scanned behind them to make sure no one had followed them, they hopped out of the car and made their way up to the front door of this house and knocked. Within seconds, the door had swung open, and standing in front of them was the leader of the 74 Hoover Crips. She looked at them with a neutral expression, then scanned behind them to make sure they were alone, and then she told them to come inside. It would turn out the real leader of the 74 Hoover Crips was not Bo. It was his mother, Mary Thompson, one of the leading anti-gang activists in the Pacific Northwest. She used her position as a mentor in the community not to try to scare young people away from gang life, but instead to actively recruit them for her gang. And for a long time, this setup had worked out great. Until recently, when her son, who really was a founder of the 74 Hoover Crips, Bo, got arrested for attacking a man with a knife. And while there were lots of witnesses to this attack, only one person was prepared to actually testify in court. And that person was Aaron, because Aaron was actually an anti-gang activist, even if it was awkward that he was testifying against Bo, the son of the person he worked with. And as Bo's trial approached, Mary decided Aaron just needed to be silenced, so she ordered his execution. When Jim and Joe confessed to killing Aaron, they never gave Mary away. They took the fall completely for the killing. But for reasons no one understands, three days after the murder, Mary herself decided to call Aaron's mother. And on this phone call, she says to Aaron's mother, if Aaron had just kept his mouth shut, none of this would have happened. Aaron's mother was floored by this statement, and so she immediately called Michaud, who also thought Mary's comment was totally out of place, and soon after, he arranged for a wiretap of Mary's phones, and quickly the full extent of her involvement in citywide gang activity and the role she played in Aaron's murder became clear. Mary was ultimately found guilty of aggravated murder and sentenced to life in prison. But due to a legal technicality, her sentence was reduced and she was released after serving only 23 years. Before his death, Aaron had become an organ donor, and after his death, five people received his organs and their lives were saved because of Aaron. After spending 21 years in the U.S. Army, a man retires and moves to Central Florida with his wife and young son. 
Although his family had plenty of money because he had a pension coming in and his wife still worked full time, he just got bored really quickly after moving to Central Florida and decided he would just take a job doing something just to stay occupied. And so he ended up taking a job at a highway gas station. One of the primary reasons he chose this particular job is because the owners of the gas station didn't care if his son came along to help him stock shelves and hang out behind the cash register. And so for years, that's just how it went. The man would work at the gas station and his son would tag along. Even after his son became a teenager and you'd think might be wanting to do other things, well, the town was so small, there was almost nothing to do. So his son still came along well into his teenage years. One night in 1990, his son, who was 15 years old at the time, was at the station and he was actually taking a break sitting outside on a picnic table. He was reading a magazine, drinking a Mountain Dew, and you know, it's dark out, and he notices out of the corner of his eye that there is a woman walking off of the highway towards the gas station. It was a very quiet night at the time, so there's no cars getting gas, there's nobody there, and there's not really anybody even driving on the highway, and so that's why she really stood out to him. And he turns and he notices her and he thinks to himself, you know, no one ever walks to our gas station. We're on a highway. Everybody drives here. So she must have broken down and she must be coming here to try to use our phone to call a tow truck or something like that. So the woman is walking across the lot, coming closer and closer to the gas station. And the boy at this point has turned his attention back to his magazine. But he would say later that he kept looking up and keeping an eye on her because there was something off about her. The woman ultimately walks right behind him and goes in the door into the gas station. Doesn't acknowledge the boy, doesn't say hi to him, just walks straight inside. And she starts walking up and down the aisles of the gas station. Now, from where the boy was sitting, it's all glass, so he could clearly look in and see his father behind the counter. And he could see the head of this woman as she walked in and around all these aisles. And as soon as the woman was in the store, kind of pacing around the aisles, the boy put his magazine down and was just watching. And he noticed that she was not really shopping. She was just looking down for a few seconds, wouldn't pick anything up, so she wasn't buying anything. And she would look up at the counter where his father was, and she would just stare at him. And then she'd look back down at what she was doing, and she would go through all the aisles. And at some point, the woman just kind of abandons this phony, I'm pretending to shop routine, and just walks up to the counter. Now, nobody else is in the store. There's nobody else coming in. And so the boy could actually fairly clearly hear what she was saying to his father. And she told his father that she had broken down and she needed a ride and could he drive her to Ocala, which was the next big town north of this gas station. And the boy would say that his father acted very strangely because his father is normally incredibly pleasant with all the customers. He's very chatty even. Like he talks to everybody who comes in the store. But as soon as this woman had gone in, his dad had seemed kind of dismissive and almost rude to this woman. And when she was talking to him, asking for a ride, he just said, no, I won't give you a ride. The woman is annoyed by how quickly she's been shot down. But instead of just taking no for an answer, she turns and looks at the boy, the boy who's sitting out on the bench, who's looking right at her, and she points at the boy and she says, what about him? Is he your son? Can he give me a ride? The boy notices that his father, who's not within her eyesight, is looking at his son going, no. Like, whatever she wants from you, you're going to say no to it. And the boy's a little bit confused by this because he's still trying to understand why his dad was so against helping this woman because she clearly needs our help or someone's help. But he just took his dad at face value. And when the woman's pointing at him, he knew the boy that if she came over and asked him, he would say no. But it wouldn't come to that because the boy's father would say to the woman, no, my son's not going to give you a ride. You need to leave here immediately. Do not come back. Leave. We're not going to help you. She's furious. She's cussing him out. She storms out and slams the door. She starts cussing at the boy and she walks off the whole time. She's turning around and flipping them off and screaming profanities at them. But she ultimately walks off and the dad kind of followed her out and is standing next to his son as she walks off. And the boy asks his dad, like, what what was her deal? Why did that happen? Why did you why did you not want to help her? And the dad just said, I don't know. There was just something, there was something off about her. And I, I don't know how to place it, but I did not want her around you. I, I knew I didn't want to give her a ride. I just, I knew she had to go. A year later, the boy is in his room when he hears his dad in the other room yelling for him to come in here and look at the TV. So he runs into the TV room and on the TV is the same woman from the gas station better known as Eileen Warnos. She was a serial killer who used to pick up her male victims at gas stations in Florida. It's unclear whether the boy or the boy's father were her next victims, but by the time she had shown up at that gas station, she'd already killed four people. 
And following that interaction with them at the gas station, she had gone on to kill three more people, including someone in Ocala, Florida, which was the town she had asked them to give her a ride to. Eileen had been caught, that's why she was on TV, and she was later sentenced to death. In the 1970s, a young woman and young man were on their very first date together, and it wasn't going very well. It wasn't going badly, it was just really, really awkward. They just were not meshing at all. And so as they're getting ready to leave and retire for the night, the guy is thinking to himself, I have nothing to lose here, we're probably not gonna go on a second date. And he says to the woman, hey, do you wanna not go home right now and actually come on a hike with me? And he goes, I know this sounds like a terrible idea, but hear me out. I go mountain climbing in this area called Provo Canyon. It's not that far from here. There are these beautiful trails that lead up the side of the canyon to these amazing scenic overlooks. And tonight it's a new moon, so there's great visibility. And I just think that you might enjoy it. And so at first, the woman is obviously a little bit hesitant. But when he says, look, I go hiking there at night all the time. I love it out there. And I promise if there's any weirdness, if you don't like being there, we'll just turn around and leave. It's totally safe. And so after a little bit of coaxing, she finally says, okay, you know what? That sounds fun. Let's go do it. And so their date that had been really awkward suddenly became really exciting. And the two of them were kind of like thrilled, like, wow, look at us making our way up for a nighttime hike through Provo Canyon. And so they arrive at the, the mouth of this canyon and they're both obviously excited and they hop out and they start walking up this trail that brings them into a heavily forested section of the canyon. Now to this point, the guy felt like this was a really great idea. He really had gone hiking here a bunch and he really did know the area well. But as the trail brought them into the forested area, the guy remembers feeling this overwhelming sense of dread. He didn't know why, it was just like an overwhelming sense of anxiety that something bad was going to happen to them. But he had worked so hard to convince his date to come with him and had convinced her it was safe that he's not about to let on to her that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so he put on, you know, his strong face and just kind of suppressed it and just kept on walking and, you know, holding her hand tight and they just continued their walk. But his sense of dread would just build and build to the point where he was really on edge. And what he didn't know, but would find out later, is that his date, the woman, she also had this horrible sense of dread as soon as they went into the forest, but she didn't want to tell him because she didn't want to seem like a party pooper because he seemed really excited about it. At some point as they're walking down this path, the man steps on something that felt soft. He didn't know what it was, but it caused him to freeze immediately. And he's holding her hand. It kind of jerks her to get her to stop. And before he can even look down and see what he's standing on, he hears rustling coming from the bushes just off the trail. She hears it too, and both of them, without saying a word to each other, because again, you gotta remember, they're both really stressed. They haven't let on to the other how stressed they are, but they're both basically ready to leave. And so the two of them turn around and they hightail it out of there. He has no idea what he stepped on. They don't know what they heard in the bushes, but they don't care. The anxiety was so high, they just wanted to leave. Years later, that man and woman who had this very strange date would actually be married. And they'd be sitting down watching TV together and they're flipping through the channels and they land on an interview with a death row inmate. And the interviewer is asking the inmate, was there ever a time that you were almost caught red-handed? And the guy being interviewed says, yes, one time. I was in the forest up in Provo Canyon one night and a young couple came walking up the trail. I didn't see him. So I only had a chance to jump into the bushes right next to the trail, and the guy actually stepped on the body of a girl I had just killed. But for some reason, he didn't look down and see what he was standing on, and the two of them didn't notice me just a few feet away from them. They just turned around and walked away. Turns out that young couple had run into one of the worst serial killers of all time, Ted Bundy. Before Bundy was executed, he confessed to over 30 murders, but many people believe the true number of victims is much, much, much higher. By most people's standards, Susan Monica's life had been pretty good. She had a small but very close group of friends, she had a great job working as an engineer, and she lived in one of the most exciting cities in the world, San Francisco, California. But Susan was not happy. Moving to the big city was not so much a choice as it was a product of life and circumstance. 
Deep down, Susan had always been someone who preferred peace and quiet and being alone, things that were in rare supply in a big city like San Francisco. Many nights after work, Susan would come home to her apartment and she would sit there and dream about moving away from the city and living off the grid somewhere on a farm, you know, raise her own food and be totally self-sufficient away from everybody else in the world. And then one day in 1991, when Susan was 43 years old, she made that dream a reality. That year, she wound up purchasing a 20-acre farm located in a forest in a little town in Oregon called Weimar. However, this farm was really not a farm. There was nothing on it. There was no house for Susan to live in. There was no barn for her animals or tools. There was no running water, no electricity, no septic system. It was just pure Oregonian wilderness. But to Susan, it was perfect. The property kept her far away from other people, and she liked the idea of having to literally build her own farm. After all, she was an engineer by trade, so she actually knew how to build buildings efficiently and safely, and she was a big, strong, sturdy woman who was not afraid of manual labor. So when Susan finally arrived in Weimar and made her way up the winding dirt road through the forest and arrived in front of her property and looked out at the vast, rugged landscape for the first time, she was filled with a rush of excitement. Even though there was nothing on her 20 acres, it already felt like home. Over the next several months, Susan would transform these 20 acres into a neat little farm, complete with a big barn and a shack for her to live in and a few animal pens for livestock. However, after the farm was built, Susan realized that building the farm was actually not the hard part. The hard part was maintaining the farm, going out there every day and doing all of her chores, feeding all the animals and doing all the different projects she had in mind. It was exhausting. And so not long after the farm was complete, Susan realized that as much as she wanted to be totally alone out there, she had to set that aside and hire some help. And so Susan printed out all of these help wanted flyers and put them all over town in Weimar. And before long, people began making their way up to her property to inquire about the role. Most of these applicants were people who struggled to find work elsewhere, either because they lived a sort of transient lifestyle, bouncing around from place to place so no one was ready to hire them long term, or because they had a criminal record and just straight up could not get a job. But Susan didn't care about either of those things. All she cared about was the people she hired would work hard and they would respect the peaceful, calm atmosphere she was fostering on her farm. Basically, do the work and leave me alone. And over the next 20 years, Susan would find dozens of people who were able to do just that. Most of them would work for Susan only for a short period of time. Others would stick around for a little bit longer, but eventually all of Susan's workers kind of rotated pretty quickly and moved on to other things. And when that happened, Susan would simply put up more help wanted flyers in town and hire more people. And in all the 20 years that Susan had been hiring these temporary workers at her farm, after they did move on and went somewhere else, Susan never heard about them again. However, that was about to change. On January 1st, 2014, Susan, who was 66 years old by this point, was outside of her shack out on her driveway when she happened to look up and see a car coming up her road. Now remember, she lives in the middle of nowhere. No one comes out to see her. So this is a very rare event. And so Susan is totally keyed in on this car. And this car, they pull into her driveway and then out of the car pop three young people. It was two young men and one young woman. And before Susan could even ask them who they were or why they were here, they were telling her. They said they were looking for their father, Robert Haney, who at one point had told them he was working on Susan's farm in exchange for a little cash, and also Susan was letting him park his camper on her property, and he was living in that camper. The kids said their father always checked in with them at least once every couple of months, but they had just gone this really long stretch without hearing from him, and since he didn't have a cell phone and no permanent address, they had no real way of getting in touch with him, and so they were out there looking for him to make sure he was okay. And so they asked Susan, do you remember our dad, Robert? And if so, do you know where he is? Even though this whole situation was totally surprising for Susan because she almost never got visitors, so that alone was kind of jarring for her. But when she heard the kids say their dad's name, Robert Haney, she immediately knew who that was. Susan told them that she had hired their father the previous spring to help build a structure on her farm. And initially, Robert was really nice to have around the farm. He worked really hard, he kept to himself, he was quiet, and he had a dog that was really friendly and loving. 
But in August of the previous year, so five months into Robert's employment on Susan's farm, Susan would tell them that their dad totally changed. He started drinking really heavily and not really working very much and spending a lot of the day just kind of ranting and raving outside of his camper about how he wanted to exact his revenge on someone. Susan would eventually find out that what Robert was talking about is apparently one of his kids had been assaulted and he felt very guilty that he had not been there to protect his child. And so the way Robert was handling this guilt was by drinking and thinking about getting his revenge on the attacker. Now, while Susan did understand why Robert felt the way he did and why he was kind of acting the way he was, it didn't change the fact that Robert's behavior had become very disruptive on her farm, and the one thing Susan really wanted was peace and quiet. And so she decided she would have to go confront Robert about his behavior and potentially fire him if he couldn't find a way to calm down. But before Susan ever had to do that, Robert one day just walked right up to her shack, he handed her an envelope filled with cash, and he asked Susan if she wouldn't mind looking after his dog for a while. And Susan was so taken aback by his complete change in behavior and this request that she just took the envelope and said, okay, I'll look after your dog. And then Robert nodded as thank you, he turned around and he walked away from her. And then a few moments later, Susan's standing there with the envelope in hand, watching as Robert is climbing into some white car that had just pulled up in front of the property. She didn't know who was in the car with him. And then the car turned around and drove out of sight. Susan told the kids that that had happened back in September, so about four months ago. And since he left, she had not heard from him, despite the fact she still had his dog. And she told the kids that a lot of Robert's stuff was still in his camper. Susan brought the kids over to the side of her property where Robert's camper was, and when they went inside, sure enough, all their father's things were all over the place. But the one item that immediately stood out to them was their father's tool belt. They knew their father was a traveling handyman, that was how he made his living, and so it begged the question, why would he leave his tool belt here if he knew he was going to be gone for several months potentially? It didn't make any sense. After leaving Robert's camper, the kids thanked Susan and asked her to please be in touch if she learned anything else about their dad, and she said she would. And then the kids got back in their car, and they began driving south towards the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. When they got there, they asked to file a missing person report for their dad. However, they learned very quickly that it was going to be very challenging to locate their dad because their dad lived this transient lifestyle with no cell phone, he had no permanent address, he had nothing that could really be traced. But the investigators agreed with Robert's children that their dad's absence was a big concern given the fact that his last interactions with Susan had consisted of him drinking very heavily and talking about going and getting his revenge on his child's attacker. And so the sheriff and the deputies were very concerned that that was exactly what Robert had done. He had gone out and potentially murdered someone and now was in hiding. So they asked Robert's kids if they could think of absolutely anything that could possibly allow investigators to track down Robert. And at some point, one of the kids said, oh, what about my dad's EBT card? EBT cards, or electronic benefit transfer cards, are like debit cards for state welfare services. You can use the cards to buy things like groceries, and the cards are definitely traceable. A few days later, when Robert's EBT card trace came back, investigators saw the card had been used just one month earlier in a Walmart located about 30 minutes southwest of Susan's farm. Now, this trace obviously didn't tell investigators where Robert was right now or what kind of condition Robert was in, but they had no other leads to operate on, so they decided they would go to the Walmart and see what they could find. When they got there, the investigators were led to the back room of the building where they were able to review the security footage from the previous month when Robert was supposedly there with his EBT card. But after reviewing hours and hours and hours of footage, the investigators never saw Robert on camera. However, they did see Susan on camera, and unbelievably, she was the one using Robert's EBT card. And so obviously this was very suspicious and right away the investigators left the Walmart, went back to their office and began the process of getting a search warrant to search Susan's farm. A few days later on January 10th, the sheriff and his deputies arrived at Susan's property and when they pulled onto her driveway, Susan came outside to greet them. When she asked them, you know, what's going on, they told her, hey, we're here to search your property in connection with Robert Haney's disappearance. 
And before Susan could ask any more questions, the sheriff said to her, hold on, just turn around, let's go back inside, I need to talk to you privately. And so Susan, who was very shocked by this, just said, okay, and she turned around and led the sheriff into her house while the other deputies fanned out across the property to begin this big search. Once inside of Susan's house, they sat down in her kitchen, and right away, the sheriff says to Susan, okay, I have you on camera using Robert's EBT card. I know you stole it, so you need to tell me where Robert is right now, or it's going to get a whole lot worse for you. And as soon as he said this, Susan's look of shock on her face quickly turned into a look of kind of relief. It was like suddenly she understood what was going on here. And she says to the sheriff, no, I didn't steal his EBT card. He gave it to me along with an envelope full of cash when he left four months ago. And he told me to use it to buy dog food for his dog that I'm looking after. And since Robert had been gone for all these months, she had run out of cash to pay for the dog food and now was using the EBT card. Susan also added that if she had just stolen the card from Robert, she wouldn't be able to use it because it requires a PIN number, and Robert gave her the PIN number. That's how she was able to use it. The sheriff was not totally sold on Susan's story, and so he continued to ask more questions, trying to trip Susan up about how she came to acquire this card, but Susan was very firm that Robert had given her the card, and that was it. And so after several minutes, the sheriff realized that Susan was likely telling the truth, which meant the EBT card angle was likely a dead end, and they would have to call off the search. But as the sheriff was standing up to leave the kitchen and leave the property altogether, a deputy from outside came running into the kitchen and without saying a word, just bent down and whispered something into the sheriff's ear. And as the sheriff is listening to this deputy, his face is contorting in disgust. He can't believe what he's being told. And after the deputy stands up and leaves the kitchen, the sheriff takes a deep breath and then looks at Susan and says, Ma'am, you're going to have to come with us. Back at the station, a now very flustered Susan was led into a small interrogation room where she sat down looking totally anxious. She's looking around, wondering what's going on. And then the sheriff walked into the room, immediately hit record on the camera, and then looked at Susan and says, Has anyone died on your property? The story that Susan would tell the sheriff that day in the interrogation room was so completely unexpected and horrific, it would make headlines all across the country. Before Susan began this story, she told the sheriff that everything she had said about Robert Haney's disappearance had been the truth. However, she had left one little detail out. After Robert had handed Susan that envelope full of cash and the EBT card, and then climbed into that stranger's car and driven away, after that, Robert had actually come back to her farm and recently. Susan said she discovered his return when one morning she got up and she went outside to go feed her animals when she looked over at the pig pen and saw all the pigs who would normally be laying down and lounging around at that time of the day. They were all up and they had converged in one portion of the pig pen and they had kind of formed a circle around something on the ground as if they were all trying to look at something on the ground. Now, Susan said this was totally uncharacteristic, so obviously something weird was going on. And so Susan dropped her food and rushed over to the fence. She climbed into the pig pen, and as she got closer and closer to all these pigs, she realized they weren't just looking at something on the ground, they were eating something on the ground. And so Susan goes right up to this ring of pigs, and she begins pulling them aside, and then right in the middle on the ground is Robert. He was laying on his back and his insides had all been torn out. It was like the pigs were disemboweling him. And the most shocking thing is Robert was still alive. He was moving his arm and groaning. Susan tried to pull the pigs off of Robert, but she said they kept coming back and really aggressively continued to eat Robert. It was like they were in this feeding frenzy. And so Susan said, you know, I thought about lifting him up and moving him, but Robert was practically split in two, and she felt like if she tried to move him, that would kill him anyways. And so Susan said she did the thing that she thought was right at the time. She left the pig pen, went into the barn, got a shotgun, ran back to the pig pen, raised the weapon, and fired it into Robert. Susan told the sheriff that this was purely an act of mercy. She was ending his suffering. 
After Robert was dead, Susan said she just left the pig pen, and then three days later, she went back into the pig pen with bags and collected the little bits of Robert that had not been eaten by her pigs. And then she took those bags of remains and chucked them into her barn on top of the trash pile. But clearly, Robert's remains had not remained in the barn because the thing that deputy had whispered into the sheriff's ear when the sheriff was talking to Susan in the kitchen was, Sir, we found a leg outside. It was Robert's leg, and it was found not inside of the barn in the trash pile, but out in the middle of her property, just out in the open. Susan, when confronted with that information, suggested that, you know, maybe a wild animal had gone into the barn, got a hold of it, and dragged it off. The sheriff didn't even know what follow-up questions to ask, and so he just said, well, why didn't you call 911 when you first saw Robert? I mean, maybe we could have saved him. Or at least, after he was dead, why didn't you tell someone? Susan would say that the reason she didn't tell anyone is she was afraid that if word got out about what her pigs had done, then her pigs would be euthanized and she would lose a major revenue stream because she sold her pigs meat in town. And she said even if her pigs were not euthanized, she was worried people in town would not want to buy her pigs meat after they learned her pigs were attacking and eating humans. Susan would tell the sheriff exactly where they could find the bags that contained Robert's remains, and she even said she would take a polygraph test to show she was now telling the whole truth. But when she actually sat down to take the polygraph test, she kept fidgeting and coughing and doing these really dramatic sighs, and it was causing the test operator to get really inaccurate readings. And so when this first polygraph test was over, the results were inconclusive. And so the investigators made Susan take another test, but again, she continued to fidget and yawn. And so finally, the investigators in the room watching this happen just called off the test. And when they did, they said to Susan, you know, hey, we're going to search your farm. And if there is anything on your farm that you have not told us about, you're going to be in serious trouble because we're going to find it. At this point, Susan kind of stopped fidgeting and she looked up at the investigators. And after a long pause, she reached out across the table and grabbed a piece of paper and a pen. She pulled it back and she began drawing something. And after a few seconds, it became pretty clear she was drawing a map of her farm. And after the map was all drawn out, she drew a big X in the middle of it and then slid the map back across the table to the investigators. And she said, if you go to that X, you'll find Steven. And the investigators are like, who's Steven? We're talking about Robert. What are you talking about? Well, it would turn out Robert was not the only farmhand to die on Susan's property. In 2012, about a year before Susan hired Robert, she hired another man named Steven Delacino. And according to Susan, Stephen was a lot like Robert. He was really easy to get along with, he was quiet, he worked hard. But at some point, Susan said they had a big falling out. Susan said she started to suspect that Stephen was stealing her guns in her barn, and so she went to confront him. And during this confrontation, they got into this big fight, and Susan said she didn't really remember all the details of what happened next, but at some point during this fight, a gun went off, and then Stephen fell to the ground in the middle of the pig pen with his head bleeding, and all of Susan's pigs suddenly swarmed him and began eating him. The stunned investigators again asked Susan, okay, if that really happened the way you said it did, why didn't you call 911 if this was like an accident? And Susan would say again that her big fear was her pigs would either be euthanized or word would get out that her pigs were eating people and the people in town would not want to buy her pig's meat because of that. In the end, as far-fetched as Susan's stories were about what happened to Robert Haney and Stephen Delacino, there was never any evidence that actually contradicted her claims. And so as a result, when Susan went on trial for murdering Robert and Stephen, it came down to whether or not the jury believed Susan. And they didn't. Not at all. They believed that Susan was completely lying, and that in reality, Susan, who was known to have a very quick temper, shot Stephen and shot Robert very much on purpose, and then threw them into her pig pen. We can only hope they were dead before her pigs began eating them. On April 21st, 2015, more than a year after Robert's children had reported him missing, Susan was convicted of two counts of murder for Robert and for Stephen, and two counts of abusing a corpse. She was sentenced to a minimum of 50 years in prison. While in custody, Susan would be overheard saying there were 17 other bodies buried on her property. 
However, when the police went out there and searched again very extensively, they never found any other remains. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you enjoyed today's story, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, just called Mr. Ballin, where we have literally hundreds more stories just like this one, but many of those stories are only available on YouTube. So go check it out, Mr. Ballin on YouTube. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time. A mildly effective. <laughs> mildly effective. <laughs> I want to make a mildly effective cold medicine made exclusively out of Egyptian fire ants. <gasps> Take its horn off its head and you beat it to death. <laughs> Say <Sing> out! <laughs> die. You, you die. <laughs> Turned and leapt head first out the glass window. <laughs> Bow! <laughs> yes! <laughs> got up on its flippers and it began chasing us down the cave. <laughs> a nice hot thigh maga moss. And we settled on a piping hot plate of <laughs> piping hot plate of eagle tonsils, your smoked chicken gallbladder eggnog, your zebra cornea souffle. Get to go surfing. <laughs> surfing. But it did <laughs> no! Yes, it did. Papa, tu dois avoir. <laughs> Papa, tu dois avoir. Lungy was already in there, and he looks at me, and he says, Papaye, de veriamos terrificado com hello fresh. Oh, Lungy, he put on... <laughs> oh, Mr. Bolin. It's not even funny. If you're wondering why I just shared a whole slew of me just butchering my various intros and different parts of strange, dark, and mysterious videos... Well, it's because you all asked for it. Last month, in our first ever Mr. Ball and Newsletter, we posed a question. We said, what do you want me to share with you the most? And overwhelmingly, what you all wanted to see was a compilation of bloopers. And you don't want to miss the next newsletter because maybe there's something else you want to see, and that newsletter might give you a chance to actually see that thing happening. And also, remember, the newsletter encompasses basically everything we're up to, both things that are coming up in the future, things that you might have missed, what we're doing now, and it's designed to be really easy to consume. It's very visual. It's not all text. Like, it's very beautiful. It's an incredibly good newsletter. And so to sign up, all you got to do is go to ballinstudios.com and input your email, and boom, you're signed up. Also, you can just click the link in the description below. That will also get you signed up for the newsletter. And then we will deliver it to you, you know, once a month and boom, there you go. You're in the know. So thank you to all the people who have already signed up. And in advance, thank you so much to those that are about to go sign up. And I'm sorry to those that plan to not sign up because really you're missing out. And you know what? See Gallong? He's going to be pretty disappointed in you. So there's that too. Okay. Peer pressure. Go get it done. Ballinstudios.com. Sign up for our incredible monthly newsletter. Thank you so much. See ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here. Last weekend, I looked over and I saw old Seagull Lung sitting at his miniature 1999 era G3 iMac, and I couldn't help but notice he was looking a little downtrodden. And when I saw what he was doing on his iMac, I knew why. He was hitting refresh over and over and over again on his MySpace page, and it wasn't changing the numbers. Old Lung hasn't had a view on his MySpace page since 2010. To cheer him up, I decided I would purchase a MySpace view bot and flood his page with tens of views. So I ran over to my windmill-powered laptop and began slapping away at the keys to navigate to an online vendor that sold MySpace view bots. However, as soon as I clicked on the link, www this website is a virus, not an online vendor for MySpaceViewBots.com, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. Unbelievably, that website was riddled with malware, and so immediately, my windmill-powered laptop caught on fire and then exploded, sending shrapnel raining down on me. Luckily, old Long was in the other room, and he heard the commotion, and he leapt into the room, and he pushed me out of the way just in time.
time. And then after the dust had settled, old Lung gave me a big hug and then slapped me right in the anti-tragus and said, Papa, when du standig auf gefährliche Webseiten klickst, dann brauchst du NordVPN. Which, of course, in German means, Papa, if you're going to keep clicking on dangerous websites, then use NordVPN. And boy, was all lucky right. <laughs> A VPN, or Virtual Private Network, is a service that keeps you safe when you browse the internet. And NordVPN is the brand name in the VPN space. Not only will NordVPN keep your data safely behind their wall of next-generation encryption, but also, most importantly, they will block malware-hosting websites and annoying pop-up ads and botnet control. So, if your online shopping seems to always turn into explosions and other various catastrophes caused by malware-hosted websites, then you need to take old Lungy's advice too and sign up for NordVPN today. Right now, you can sign up for a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus get four additional months for free when you go to nordvpn.com slash MrBallin. And it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash MrBallin, or click the link in the description below. Okay, back to the story. Before we go any further, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Experian. Back when I was just a young buck in college, I was broke. And so naturally, I took out a credit card with a $5,000 limit and immediately maxed it out on buffalo chicken calzones and beer. Now, as soon as my card got declined, I didn't pay it off. Instead, I just took the card, tucked it back into my wallet, and forgot about it. But the bank did not forget about my $5,000 debt, and my failure to pay it back wrecked my FICO score. A FICO score is a type of credit score. Over the last 10 years, I've been able to rebuild my credit score, but it has been a slow and painful process. And so my suggestion to you is to avoid the unpaid beer and calzone credit trap and just closely monitor your credit score. And with Experian, you can do that for free. In addition to closely monitoring your credit score, they will also send you alerts anytime your credit changes. Experian also offers a dark web scan. If you've ever been the victim of a data breach, and you may not know if you have or not, your information potentially could live in the dark web. And that's a place where criminals could use it to commit fraud. And if that happens, it'll wreck your credit along with a bunch of other horrible things, unless you catch it and report it. And on that, if you do find inaccuracies on your credit report, you can easily submit disputes and track those disputes on Experian's online dispute center. It is time to take charge of your credit. Get Experian credit monitor alerts, your FICO score, and that dark web scan all for free, just go to Experian.com slash MrBallin. Again, that's E-X-P-E-R-I-A-N.com slash MrBallin. Okay, back to the story. Today's podcast is sponsored by the online therapy platform, BetterHelp. Stress can rear its ugly head in all types of ways. Maybe work has you anxious about deadlines, or maybe you're worried that the college fund you've been investing in for years is actually not going to be enough for your kids. And maybe you don't even know you're stressed. In fact, many people don't always recognize the physical symptoms of stress. Things like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive problems. But nowadays, no one has the time to go to the doctor's office and fill out all that paperwork and then wait around for the doctor to finally come out to help you deal with your stress. But that doesn't mean you need to let your mental health suffer. Now, you can get the professional help you need from the comfort of your own home. And that's with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and financial aid is available to those who need it. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, making it super easy and free to change therapists if needed. In today's world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, do less, and maybe try some therapy. So, give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. Mr. Ballin listeners can get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash mrballinpod. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash mrballinpod. Pod. 
The next and final story of today's episode is called The Old Man's Secret. Hey, Prime members, you can binge eight new episodes of the Mr. Ballin podcast one month early and all episodes ad free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. And before you go, please tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at Wondery.com slash survey. If you're listening to this podcast, then chances are good you are a fan of The Strange, Dark, and Mysterious. And if that's the case, then I've got some good news. We just launched a brand new Strange, Dark, and Mysterious podcast called Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries. And as the name suggests, it's a show about medical mysteries, a genre that many fans have been asking us to dive into for years, and we finally decided to take the plunge, and the show is awesome. In this free weekly show, we explore bizarre, unheard of diseases, strange medical mishaps, unexplainable deaths, and everything in between. Each story is totally true and totally terrifying. Go follow Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're a Prime member, you can listen early and ad-free on Amazon Music.